All right, guys, hopefully everyone's not left the chat room and uh, cleared out of here at this train wreck. But I think we've got, uh, I think we've got it figured out, at least for tonight, of uh, what we're going to do here with Chris to make sure he is uh, getting his tutorial and learning how to paint and you guys are being able to watch along. So um, what we're going to... What, I, what I've done is just set my computer up here to stream my desktop. I've got uh, Google Plus up streaming to Chris, and uh, you guys are, are seeing the desktop with, uh, with what I'm streaming to him. So um, this will get thrown up on uh, YouTube when we're done and hopefully cleaned up a little more so that um, uh, everyone can enjoy this a little better. So, so Chris, um, let's start with, uh, with what you got here. We got uh, P. Iris. That was who you were saying you wanted to to get painted, and uh, you were talking to me via email how you wanted uh, your Mercs in your army to um, to have a very uh, subtle, very subdued type color scheme. Um, what are, why don't you tell us some of your thoughts behind that? What is it you're looking for there? Well, I'm kind of looking for like. Um my my, uh, my Signar is my main army, and I'm kind of looking for them to have like a blue and kind of a, almost like a regal look with a more expensive looking like nice armor and more of a clean cut look. And then for my mercenaries to kind of look a little more rugged and a little more um, just like neutral look so that when um, I transfer them and put them in with another army or something, that they won't be identified with my Signar look. Okay, so something that identifies him as a mercenary and uh, has a little bit more of a worn and, and ragged type look to him. Okay, um, what I've done here, just to give you, you a heads up, is I've, I've gone ahead and assembled and primed the model. Um, I did uh, a little bit of a zenithal priming on her, um, you know, black underneath and then white from above. And this was just done with the um, P3 primer, okay? The white P3 primer and then the black P3 primer. Have you ever done uh, zenithal priming like this before? I have not. I've only done either black or white or green. Okay. Um, I've really only for miniature painting, I've only done um, my trolls. I did like a 15 point troll army before I realized that I was more interested in Signar. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So, um, <laughs> that's where I had a lot of the trouble figuring out what to paint first and like doing all of the shading and realized that I needed to look a little bit more into what to do okay. before I started messing up some more models. Okay, good. Well and that was another thing that we talked about in email was order of operations. You know, how to in what order do you apply the colors, where do you start? Um, how do you prevent getting your colors mixed up, you know, in other words, painting in the line kind of thing. So, well, and we'll talk about a lot of that e either tonight or, or in part two of this as well. Um, but just to go back to the zenithal priming thing, it's really simple. If you um, mount your miniatures on a cork like this, or even if you were to take a, um, a pin vise, you get yourself a couple of these off of eBay, they're usually like $3 each. Um, and you know, screw a hole up into the, the base of the miniature and then attach a wire in there or attach a, a bit of copper uh, copper tubing and then put it into your pin vise, then you've got another way to, to hold your miniature. The point is, is you want some kind of way to, to base or to hold the miniature so that you can manipulate it from different angles. And when I do zenithal priming like this, I'll spray from the bottom uh, in the black and then I'll spray from the top in the white. And usually I'm about 12 to 14 inches away, a couple of quick spurts, and um, I usually keep the coats really thin. In fact, if you look um, here at the bottom of her cape, you can actually still see some of the metal showing through. I keep my primer coats very thin. You're going to hear a few different opinions about that, I'm sure. Um, this is just what's worked for me and what I've found to be successful. Um, when you apply your primer so that it's so thick that you can't see the, the metal underneath, um, I think you're inhibiting the ability of, of paint to stick to it. So um, keep your primer coats thin and, and I think you'll, you'll be okay with that. 
Um, the other thing you can do with the zenithal priming too is you can spray the white from different directions to create highlights and shades you know specifically like if we wanted you know the front of her cape to be more highlighted than say uh, the back of her body here we could focus that white primer just right there along the front I've done more of like a global type highlighting where it's just come straight from above so um, you know that's the nice thing about zenithal priming is is it also kind of gives you an idea of, of where your shadows and your highlights are going to be um, the cape here is a is a good uh, example of that you can see you still got your black showing here you've got your white showing in the middle right in this area and then fading back to the black again so when we paint the cloak here that would be kind of the way that we would want to follow the highlight to shadow um, and that's I think one of the biggest advantages of of zenithal priming is uh, it's almost like a cheat sheet of shading or shadows and light blending. Yeah, exactly. And and you know one thing that I've seen that you can do is, um, and I've even done this a couple times on some models, is uh, um, take a picture of the model after you prime it, and then you can refer back to that picture later as you're painting it to determine where your highlights and your shadows go. So. Um, I've seen people do that, and I've done and I've done that as well. So let's set her down for a second, and I want to talk a little bit about color scheme for you. Um, grays, grays and browns are kind of what I remember talking about uh, mostly with you, and I think if to to go with a creating a scheme that's going to be a subtle, subdued um, type of scheme, sticking with the Crix colors, I think is actually what's going to help you get that. Um, what I'm going to do, if it's okay with you and you think it's going to work, is uh, I'm actually going to base, we'll start with the cloak tonight, I'm going to base the cloak in Crick's Bane highlight. Okay? And then the shading, the first layer of shading I'm going to do will be in Crick's Bane base. And then the second layer of shading, which will hopefully be the darkest layer, we'll see how it looks on there, is going to be a mixture of uh, umbral umber and P3 coal black. And so the idea of the color progression that we'll have is going to look something like this. And I'm going to use this card here to, to illustrate that. And um, this card will be mailed back to you as well so you can see how the colors uh, interact and play off each other. And this is what I actually do for all my miniatures when I'm painting a scheme is um, put the colors on a card like this because uh, otherwise I forget <laughs> what colors I used. A uh, good example is Maximus, that pig you saw me painting the other night. Um, I didn't write down fully the, the right recipe for the skin tones and uh, people have been asking me you know what colors I did and I'm having a hard time remembering. <laughs> And you don't want to do that in an army. You know, when you're painting an entire army of figures, you want the the color to be as you know fairly consistent. So, and so what I'll do here is I'm just going to pull a little bit of this highlight color out, pull a little bit of the Crick's Bane base out, and we're just going to I'm going to kind of blend it, show you a little bit of how that that color will progress and look. And then when we get down to the shadow, and you really can't see it because of the reflection off of the, the wet paint, but let me pull it, pull it off. And you can kind of see that progression of that gray there. Let me adjust my white balance a little more. There we go. How does that uh, that progression of gray look for you there, Chris? Yeah, it looks good. I mean, I definitely think that, that would 
that would fit where it kind of gets into like the dirtier, muddier looking kind of colors towards the darker end of the spectrum. Um, I also remember when I, we were talking about how I, I kind of, for my main army, I wanted to stick with like the silver and the gunmetal metallics and then maybe in the Mercs go a little bit more into using um, like a steel, like a dark steel and a bronze look. Yeah. And see, bronze, bronze will actually look really good with this, I think. Um, in fact, if we took uh, bright, bond, bright bronze, Vallejo game color, bright bronze, and then um, P3 pig iron. I think these are two colors that are going to work really well uh, with these with this gray cloth. Let's put the uh, pig iron right there. Let's put the bright bronze right there. And so we'll spread the bronze out. Spread that pig iron out. And you can see the the contrast. You're starting to get some nice contrast there between those those two colors. I think one other color that uh, we I think we need to put a little bit of a brighter color into this to um, to give you an idea of uh, or, or to to create a, just a little bit of contrast. We don't want too much contrast. I think with the grays. I think we just want to have a little bit of it. And so I would actually, I'd actually think a green might work. Um, blue could also work too, but a, a, a nice green that might work is a little bit of Ortic Olive. And I'd, I'd want to use that pretty sparingly. So if we were to use that on the iris here, somewhere that, that, that could go sparing, sparingly could be maybe some of these straps here or some of these armor plates. Um, if you wanted to be a little heavier with it, you could paint this inside of her cloak in the Ortic Olive. Um, that might look pretty good. Same with the inside of, of the hood here uh, around her face. Um, I like the idea of doing the, the armor platings. The armor platings? Okay. Yeah, so maybe doing uh, armor plating with... Uh, The Ortic Olive next to the um, uh, the the brass color, the bronze color that I was just uh, the bright bronze from Vallejo Game Color. That's a nice contrast right there. You got a decent palette to work with there. And if we take uh, your umbral umbral umber. And lighten it up just a little bit. You can get some nice leather colors out of that for um, some of the strapping, and uh, um, you know her quiver and things like that. So, um, what do you think? Is that going to work for you? Yeah, definitely think that'll work. Okay. Also, for contrast, we could do a bunch of marks that are redheaded stepchildren. You know. <laughs> Have you seen my um, uh, dirty Meg that I did for my Menoth army? I, I did her. I believe so. I just don't believe I remember what color here she. Yeah, she was a redhead, so that's why that's why I said that. Yeah, so we'll uh, we'll kind of play with this as we go. When um, when I send everything back to you, um, I'll have this card, which is kind of just the the messy version of this. But as we actually go through and start mixing some colors and using some colors differently, I'll have a much cleaner card that'll have labels and things taken care of for you on there, so that it's not um, it's not quite so messy. But this can, it kind of gives you a uh, an overview of what we're going to do. So. All right, with that being said, you got any questions before we get started on uh, getting some painting done? Uh, not yet. Okay, great. I guess the one thing, the other thing I've had trouble with is um, like places on the model where there's two things that are really close together, like for yeah. example on her, like at the, the butt end of her crossbow, like where it's coming up against her chest. Like, oh, right in here? Yeah, like getting getting paint in there without just okay. it everywhere. It has been, like, because I did the uh, the Trolls from Highwaymen, mm. and there were just, like, a lot of tight little spaces like that where it was, like, how do you get a brush in there and actually be able to get any sense of detail and shading? And, and I think what one of the things I'm going to do here with Iris 
And with Kane, I'm going to paint him Epic Kane just a little different than I'm doing Iris. Iris, I'm, I, I want to kind of focus on maybe some um, some quicker techniques for you to help you uh, to get through things faster. Um, we'll do some tube brush blending on the uh, on the cloak here. Um, for some of these leather straps, like in this area of her chest here and uh, right around in here on her knees and her legs, um, I'm going to show you how I do washes. Um, which is a little different than maybe how you've uh, you've seen on the on some of the websites, um, and then that'll help speed things up, and that actually addresses issues like this of getting into tight spaces, and so we'll we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, the other thing I want to talk about real quick before we get into the cloak here is, um, or maybe I can talk about it why I'm why I'm painting the cloak is this idea you were talking about um, of uh, you know kind of order of operations you know in what order do you paint things and I think there's two there's two main schools of philosophy on that um, as you talk to people who paint miniatures a lot um, a lot of people like to start working um, inside inside to out and other people start working outside to in. I think I'm more of an outside to in type individual, and the reason why is because I like to, I like to work on the biggest areas first because those are the areas that are going to take the most attention. I, I feel, and then I go down into the smaller areas and the tighter areas. And as far as you know, what do you paint first? What do you paint second? You know. I don't know if there's a, a hard fast rule um, that uh, specifically says, oh, you have to paint all the metals first, or you have to paint the face first, or you have to paint, um, you know, the leather first. I think the biggest thing, Chris, that's going to help you out with that, because I remember having that question too when I was first starting to paint miniatures, is um, being consistent. Pick pick a um, pick a color. Start with that color, paint everything on the model that color, and then move on to the next color. Um, for example, um, I'm working on painting an, a troll army right now on commission, and um, one of the things that I'm I'm doing is the the runes of war list right now, which has got uh, what three or four units of uh, rune casters in them, and uh, that's a lot of the same model to paint over and over again and it's really easy to want to tear your eyeballs out when you're done painting that one <laughs> and um, really what I've done is just um, I, I pick one color I go through the unit on that color then I go to the next color and I go through the unit on that color in fact I've got them on my shelf here let me just show them to you real quick here is a uh, two of them from two the, the same models uh, from two different units and you can see like this one here on my right finger the brown the bronze color here has been washed whereas on this one the bronze color has not been washed yet and that's because I had just haven't gotten to the washing part on this model yet also on the face too you know I've done the the orange bits on the face on this one but I but I haven't on this one and so I think what what I'm getting at with saying this is when you start working in a systematic way of painting a model you need to be consistent with it and as you start working on that consistency and being um, deliberate about what colors or what parts you're painting first uh, you start to develop some habits about your painting and that's the biggest thing that's going to uh, I think influence uh, the quality of your paint is picking a, a way to do something and then sticking with that. Um, I don't think there's a, any hard fast rules out there about uh, what you paint first or what you don't paint first. Now when you get into some of the, the detail stuff, you know, how do I keep uh, the cloak color from, from getting on her face when I, when I got to get into some of those little tight places? that's going to be a lot of practice that's going to be a lot of patience and that's going to be a lot of um, finding out what you need to do 
to get into your groove for painting. Um, a lot of people talk about holding their breath when they're painting details. I was talking about this a couple weeks ago on air actually. And I think that's one of the worst things you can do when you're painting is hold your breath because you're not going to be able to maintain the oxygen in your muscles and in your brain that you need to focus. And I think your hand is going to start shaking a lot sooner um, than it would otherwise if you um, if you were just focusing on some regular, deep, slow, uh, deliberate breathing. So right now with Iris, I'm just working on the base coat, just getting a nice, smooth finish down. So does that answer your question a little bit on the on the order of operations thing there? Yeah, I mean that's kind of what I tried to do on my trolls is I would go through like the entire set of highwaymen and be like, okay, I'm going to paint all the leather, its base coat, and then I would go back and be like, I'm going to do all the armor, and it just like doing the base coats was fine, but then it was like, okay, well I have the armor painted and I have the leather painted, and now I have to find some kind of way to to get in there and paint all the skin without getting the skin tone on the armor or the leather. Right, and that's and that's where I guess what I was saying about how I like to start on the biggest area first, you know, the cloak. I'm going to run into some problems, yeah, right in, in here in this area um, when I'm painting. Um, I'm going to run into some problems right right here, you know, against the cloak with getting the, the green on the armor plates. Um, and, you know, that's just uh, my... Something really small. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, really, what are we talking about here? Something the size of a quarter, right? <laughs> Maybe a little bigger. Um, you know, that's just going to be kind of par for the course. Now, there is some stuff you can do as far as taking some time to time to plan out your paint your your paint scheme. I do that all the time. In fact, the the centurion that I'm going to be painting for you, um, I, I'm I'm right now. I've got the parts sitting on my desk here, and I'm thinking. Okay, how am I going to paint this um, to maximize uh, the paint coverage and minimize the work? You know, because really that's that's the goal of every miniature painter, right? Is to get something done as quick as you can and, and looking as good as it can, right? <laughs> yeah, when you got a hundred points up an army sitting on your desk and you got to paint it all, you don't want to take an hour and a half, two hours per. Right. You know, yeah. Detail. Yeah, you're, you're going to go crazy if you try painting an army that way. You end up seeing me in my office one day, you know. That's a joke that I don't think people on air would get. Um, I'm a professional counselor. That's what I do for a living. <laughs> so I probably should clarify that. <laughs> All right, so uh, her... Her base coat there on the cloak is about done. I'm going to let that dry for a minute. And uh, what I'm going to do is we're going to come in here. And I'm actually going to do these these uh, green armor plates right now. Um, just to kind of talk about how to get into tight spots. Now, if I remember right, you said you had a size 2 brush, right? Yeah, I, I made the, the classic beginner mistake of um, going out to, you know, my local hobby store and buying the not-so-nice brushes in the smallest size that they sold and bought, like, the, the 5 odd and the 3 odd. Oh, the yeah. Odd, Those and are... then came home and tried to paint with them. And then I did a little more homework on brushes, and everybody was like, oh, you need, like, a 0, a 1, and a 2. And that's it. So I, um, I ordered a bunch of brushes off of Amazon the other day. Um, Brand, I believe, was um, Da Vinci. Okay, those are a decent brush, yeah. Um, they they didn't have the um, the ones that everybody talks about available in all the sizes I needed. So the the Winston and whatever Newton. Windsor and Newton. Yeah, Windsor yeah. and Newton. They didn't have those available in sizes zero, one, two, three. So I went with the Da Vinci had like a set, and um, those should be here. Today. I'm waiting for a window to prime because uh, I live down in Florida and it's like 80% humidity. 
Yeah. I think on Tuesday, the forecast is supposed to be clear and sunny and like 60 degrees. So it's going to be a good opportunity to prime everything. Yeah, that, that's, that's good priming weather right there. One thing you might want to look into is um, a paintable primer, you know, uh, with a brush. You're going to have a lot more control over the quality of the primer um, than um, than w in something in a spray can, and then also airbrushing your primer on. Um, Vallejo makes a really nice um, uh, paintable uh, polyurethane primer. Uh, that's pretty um, that's pretty durable. Has a nice tooth to it. I mean, it does create a little more work as far as um, doing more work by hand and by brush. Um, but you don't have to worry about those issues of uh, frosting and, and, and things like that. Is there a way to do the Zenithal priming method by hand painting it, or is that kind of...? No, I, I've actually seen people do it. Um, what they do is um, they'll prime the model in black, and then they'll dry brush the model in white. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and it, and it actually produces fairly decent results. Um, let me show you something real quick here. Uh, this is an incredibly trashy looking brush. You guys are probably going to be appalled that I actually have a brush like this sitting on my desk. Uh, but take a look at that. That is a nasty, nasty brush. <laughs> um, this is my size 1 Sharf that I use um, for most of my, my work. Um, this was a size, a flat uh, size 10. And I'll use this for dry brushing big areas. If you're going to do that zenithal type priming it, with um, with using that dry brush method I was just talking about, I would recommend getting a brush about this size to do that with. Okay. Yeah, it will it'll make um, it'll make the dry brushing smoother, and it will um, um, not you won't get quite as much buildup on the corners as you would using a smaller brush. Okay. Yeah. Um, one thing that I did purchase was the the Games Workshop dry paints, and so far from my experience with them, it's, I can't even pull the paint out of the pot. It's so dry. I don't know if there's any tips or tricks with that, or if you've ever tried those. Could Could you repeat that again? You're kind of um, uh, breaking up a little bit. The The Games Workshop dry paints, where it's like paint specifically for dry brushing. Uh huh. Um, I purchased some of those, and I can't even get it on the brush. I mean, it's so dry in the pot. That really? It's basically just like a chunk of dry paint in a, in a pot. Okay. I've I've not done a lot of work with um, with the, uh, um, the the Games Workshop. Um, I think they call them technique paints, if I remember right. Um, so I'd have to look into that for you. Let me look into that for you and get back to you as far as what to do on that. Um, I, I personally don't use a lot of the GW colors. I, I don't like I don't like how they paint, just to be honest. So um, so I didn't really buy a lot of the new stuff when it came out. Um, but I'll I, I'll look into that for you, Chris, and I'll figure out what um, what you might be able to do to fix that problem. I guess another question I have is, do you use anything to, to magnify the size of the miniature to help you see everything, or do you just kind of have really good eyesight? No, um, I actually have horrible eyesight. I'm very myopic, very very nearsighted. I um, can't see much past the, the tip of my nose without my glasses on. Um, and ironically, that's been one of the challenges of um, doing these broadcasts, is learning to paint with my glasses on, because typically I take them off and get my face as close to the miniature as I as I can. Um, if you, but I, I assume the reason why you're wanting to magnify is so you can see what better what you're doing. Yeah, I'm, I don't have that good of sight either. So I mean, I, I purchased one of those the magnifying glass lamps where it has like the magnifying glass and then the fluorescent bulb around it. Yep. It, it works pretty well for me. Yeah, and I've also seen guys use the. Um, um, the headgear that that uh, has the um, uh, magnifying lens in him, you know. Uh, so I've seen those work really well. Um, I'll give you a tip though on something that will improve your your ability to have more control with the brush. 
when you're holding the brush so here's your brush here don't hold it uh, really dark, far down on the on the the handle near the flute like that you don't have very much control there okay um, any movement you make is going to have a much greater impact on on the movement that the brush does um, when you're painting hold back further on the brush that's probably about where I typically hold my brush in fact you can see the paint build up on my my handle there um, that's because I get paint on my fingers and that finger and, and that paint then transfers to the to the handle of the brush you don't want to hold you know super far back but you know come back off the brush a bit and that's going to give you more control over how you manipulate that brush and how you move that brush and you'll be able to get a lot smoother um, uh, a lot smoother uh, uh, paint um, control and brush control when you're painting the other thing I'd recommend too and let me go back to the um, the base color for the cloak here to illustrate when you have an area like this where the green and the and this uh, gray color are joining don't um, what you don't want to do is try and paint the area with the tip of the brush like that you're not going to have enough control what you do want to do is use the side of the brush when you paint that area you're going to have a lot more control over the brush you're going to have a lot more control over where the paint goes when you do it that way um, in fact as much as you can um, when you paint uh, paint using the side of the brush as opposed to the tip of the brush you see the difference there Chris yep. yeah when when doing a large area like the cloak, uh -huh. um, if you notice like you kind of missed a spot somewhere, what kind of time period like is there like a, you have like a minute and a half to work on it, and then you need to wait twenty minutes for it to dry before you go back to fix it, or I mean, when, where is that like danger zone start where you're going to leave brush marks if you try to go back and touch it up? The danger zone. Oh man, cue Kenny Loggins there, huh? Um, what uh, that's going to depend um, a, a lot on on the conditions of where you're painting at okay um, being in Florida your paints probably going to dry a lot slower than it is up here in Idaho where it's a lot drier um, my paint dries really fast and and my window of time is pretty pretty short um, that being said I can take this green color here and I can dab it right on that color there and take a a moistened brush and pull that right off right away without any problems. So if I do get paint somewhere that I don't want it, I shouldn't try to use like a napkin or like a Q-tip to get it off, just a wet brush? Yeah, use a, use a moistened brush. You can use a brush with some saliva in it, okay? Um, the other thing that I like uh, about P3 paints is they're actually fairly durable and you can take an old brush like this an old cheap brush and cut the um, cut the bristles short and keep that next to you right away um, and you know you can do a different size here you know this is this is pretty large comparatively and when you get that paint when you make that mistake you know pick that up right away and use it to to uh, to brush off or, or wipe off that that almost paint that like you eraser. Made. almost like an eraser yeah yeah okay. now that would be you know on a large area like this but when you turn the the model around and you get into a tight area like this depending on on where you're at as far as how much shading you've done in here um, I would I would really just probably let it dry you know give it 20 20 minutes to dry and then just recoat it because okay, you know, like you, a lot of the trouble I had with my trolls was like the the straps for the armor, like the little tiny leather straps on like the axer and the impaler and stuff like that. Uh huh. Um, like just trying to paint those and not get it on the skin that I had already painted was like ah uh, okay. Not enjoyable. I uh, yeah okay I think I understand what you're saying now. Let me um let me grab a troll here just to or oh gosh what I've got here. Like the, the straps on the back of the neck. On the axe or in the impaler. 
Oh yeah, yeah. I want to pull my hair out. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know what you mean, man. Um, those, those were like the first two models I painted because I was like, oh, these are bigger; they should be easier to paint. Right. Yeah, that's what you would think, right? Yeah, deceptive, isn't that? Um, the bigger the more detail they put on them. So let me um let me do this. Let me uh let me zoom in here a little bit, and I just want to show you. Um, cause I think I understand what you're saying and let me zoom in here to, to kind of illustrate it. Okay. And let me adjust my focus here. Okay. So this area right here where these straps are, that's kind of what you're talking about, right? Is, is areas like that? Yeah. Just like a, like one of those like pencil thin lines of detail that you want to paint one color but you've already painted everything behind it. Okay. All right. I follow what you're saying. Um, let's take a, let's take a P3 color. I mean a um, a Vallejo color. I, it's called uh, leather, leather brown. Let me find it here. Give me just one second. There we go. Uh, Vallejo leather brown. Okay. Right there. That's kind of one of the colors I was thinking of using on her anyway um, for some of the leather colors. And let's paint that strap right now to, to kind of show you a technique that will help you keep it clean. Because that's what you're having a hard time with. Yeah, it's just kind of painted thin lines. The okay. only painting experience I had for this was you know, Bob Ross style painting where there are no accidents. <laughs> that's not true in miniature painting. Uh, well, you know, it's, it's all relative, right? Okay, so here we go. I've got my brush loaded up with some of this uh, leather brown. Okay, just going to wipe off a little bit here. Now what you want to do when you're painting this way is you do not want to try and cover that area with just the tip, painting just the tip of the brush because you don't have enough control that way. Instead, what you want to do is try and come in with the side of the brush, all right, and just very gently yeah, I was going in there with like a three off brush trying to use just the tip yeah and yeah, and you're not gonna you're 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 not gonna get very smooth uh coats that way either the um, um they're gonna you're gonna see the brush the brush uh the brush strokes in the um in the paint when you do it that way. And just as much as you can, just use the side of your brush and, and it almost becomes almost like a type of dry brushing because you're just using the side of the brush to pull along the high points on the model. And see now we've covered that area, we've painted those straps and not gotten any of the the brown on that green and then we can move on to the boot there um, I had kind of a question about those bases that you referred me to um, the resin bases oh yeah um, like if I was to paint my entire army on the bases that they came with how difficult would it be to reapply them to one of those bases? Um, it depends on how you originally attached um, the bases to the uh, privateer, uh, the model to the privateer base. Um, I mean, because typically they have like that that slot in them. Uh huh. And I, I've just been putting super glue on them and sticking them in the slot with the slot on the bottom of the model. Yeah. Yeah, you need to. Um, yeah, um, some of the plastic, the newer plastic uh, models, um, you can uh, get away with um, gluing them directly to the resin base because they're pretty light. But some of the metal ones, you you need to pin them down to the resin base, and um, yeah, they're, they're just, their footprints just aren't big enough to hold them in place. Yeah, yeah, and that's pinning. You know that that a lot of that's going to be pinning. Um, have you had much experience with that? You know how to do that? I have never pinned. Okay. What I'll do is um, I haven't started assembly on Kane yet. Um, so when I'm ready to assemble him, I can take you through that on how to pin with him. 
Okay. And um, and it'll it'll be good because that's a skill really you, you you probably should pick up. So um, it'll help you a lot in the long run. Now I just wanted to hold this here. If you look right right there, you can see where I got some of the brown onto the green. You see that there, and that's where you would want to use the tip of the brush to try and clean that up as best you can. And there you go. That brown's been cleaned up now. So when you're working right next to details that you've already painted, um, use the the side of the brush, not the uh, not the tip of your brush. And that will help you. Um, that'll help you have a lot more control over where that is um, where that color is being placed. I want to come in here and clean this brown up a little bit more. And have you have you used much um, many washes on your troll blood army? I used on the armor. I used the the black wash, the Games Workshop wash, and then on the on like their the skin and the leather, I was using the Agrax brown. Okay. Paint. Yep. And I was going with the technique of just put it on a big brush and brush the whole area, um, not really target shading anything. Okay. Just kind of covering the entire model. Um, that's kind of what I had read and seen in the videos that I had previously watched on YouTube. Okay. Just kind of just almost dunk the, the model in a wash and it'll go in all the cracks and dry off everywhere. Yeah, and that that's the, that's the typical, you know, um, the typical way that people do washes and and you know there's nothing wrong with that I'm not um, I'm not gonna bag on that or anything uh, what I like to do though is, is I like to be a little more targeted with my washes so there so there you go I got a little bit of the brown on the on the gray there and I just wiped it right off um, I like to be a little more targeted with my washes and when we fin it when I get to the point on this model where um, we're ready to do some washes I'll, I'll show you how I do that process. So kind of how, like on the avatar where you're doing all the cracks in the legs. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so there we go. That's um, you can see the green there now. I've got that. Definitely making it pop. Yeah. Yeah. And once we start getting the um, some of the shadow going on this cloak, um, I think it's really going to actually look quite nice. Um, this is probably dry enough now that we can start doing some uh, a little bit of uh, two brush blending on it. So we'll actually start on the inside right here, okay? And let me just kind of run you through two brush blending. Have you done any any reading on on that? You know much about the two br two brush blending? I watched a few brief videos on YouTube after you mentioned it. You know, okay. Little three minute videos. I, I love it. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> um, I wish I had known about it a long time ago because um, it's, uh, it's a time saver for sure. And once you get the hang of it, um, you'll, you'll, your painting will go a lot faster and you'll be able to make some great looking shades and highlights in, in very it little time. It makes more sense to me than the, the edge highlighting where you go from dark to light. Yeah. Yeah. Like when I most of the videos I initially watched, and when I tried to actually pull that off on a model, it, it always you could just see the difference in each layer you put on. Like there was like a, a clear line of where each color yeah. started and where each color and like it, it looked like three separate colors. There was no no consistency between the layers. Right. The the biggest thing to remember with with um, two brush blending is it's all about um, moisture control. If you keep the paint too wet, then you're going to lose the blend. If the paint is too dry, then you're going to end up with um, what they call uh, a paint ring, which is a line on the paint um, of, of where the, the edge of the paint had actually started to dry. And I'm going to use a, an index card here or a paint card to just kind of demonstrate how how to two brush blend. And where you want the viscosity of the paint to be. 
Yeah, yeah. Now I use, um, for most of my two brush blending, I use uh, these two brushes right here, which is a size two um, Raphael and a size one Sharf. And I also have some Winsor & Newtons here. Um, let me show you, let me grab one real quick just to show you the difference between these brushes. So this is a, a Winsor & Newton size one. And then this is a the Sharf size one. And you can see the difference in the length of the brushes there. And the scale isn't consistent throughout every brand. Well that's that's one thing for sure. Um, the scale is, is is not consistent through brands. But what I wanted to point out was, you know, from, from ferrule to tip, the Sharf has a lot more volume um, bristle. The ability to hold more paint. Yeah, so you get the, the ability not necessarily to hold more paint, but to hold more hold more moisture. So, um, which is what you want when you're when you're two brush blending. So, the size one I typically use is my application brush. The size two I typically use is my blending brush. And I'm going to put a bit of your shade color just right here in the corner. Um, I will use the P3 paints for two brush blending right out of the bottle. Um, I find that I don't have to add anything to them because you don't want them too thin or else they'll dry too fast. So um, right out of the bottle you should be you should be okay with using it. Now you'll want to take your your blending brush and it needs to be moistened. I use saliva. I, I will drag the brush through my, uh, my mouth. Um, some people will just have clean water sitting around and they'll use the clean water. Um, I find it's faster for me to just pull the brush through my mouth. So, um, but keep the clean water around to rinse your brush on a regular basis. So, um, because you don't want the paint to dry on the brush. Once you um, you pull your color off, okay, you place it where you want to place it. Then you bring your your blending brush in, and you're going to put it down on the surface and start with a horizontal motion working up into the color and then pulling it back out from the color and slowly lifting the brush away as you're pulling it back out from the color. If you take your blending brush and you stick it right into the color and swish and pull out, you're not going to get a very smooth blend. You'll get a much more blotchy blend. And so really the, the, the trick is, is starting that back and forth motion and wetting the surface as you work into the color and then pulling it back out. So let me show you what that looks like. Grab the color, place it where you want, put your blending brush down, start working back and forth prior to the color, work slowly into the color, and then start working slowly out, slowly lifting off, as you pull away. And you can see that trend. Right. Say again? You had quite a bit of um, water in the brush when you began to do that then, right? Yeah, it was fairly moist. Um, if you were here, if you were here, you were here, I'd probably run the brush over your over your fingertip or over the back of your hand so you could feel how moist it is. Um, okay. Let me show you. The paint just looks considerably thinner after you mm -hmm. did that. So it's you're, you're, instead of thinning the paint before you start, you're thinning the paint on the bottom. More or less, yeah. Now, if you, um, I've just loaded my brush, my blending brush up with quite a bit of water here. If you were to start with too much water, then you get a, a, a much different effect. You see that? Yeah. Okay, and then if you were to go you don't with. You want it to be like dripping wet, you just want it to be fairly moist. Right. And if you go with too dry of a brush, you can see what happens there. It, it gets it shortens the effect. Short. It not only shortens the effect, but it also um, you can see how how it's getting a little blotchy there, almost like a dry, wet um, watercolor. You know. Mm -hmm. And so you know again, place your color, moisten your brush, wet the area in, right in front with a back and forth motion, push into the paint, and then slowly 
pull your way out and you you start to get that transition and that's what so you're that would be something good to kind of practice on a piece of paper like that to get an idea of how much uh, you, liquid yeah like yeah and the and the paper is actually going to be a lot more forgiving because this surface is a lot more absorbent than the surface of the painted surface of the model and so you okay. um, yeah you you're, you're going to have um, a lot more flexibility but it is a good way to practice on it just to get a feel for it exactly yeah once you can reproduce consistently with that same kind of blend look and maybe try to bring it to a model right right so um i use just a, a plastic palette like this for my um, my wet blending or my two brush blending excuse me i'm just gonna swap these here a little bit Adjust my camera just a little bit here. All right, and so we're going to start shading. I'm going to start right in here. I'm pushing into the color moving that about and then I'm going to slowly start pulling out and as long as that paint is wet and you keep that edge wet you can work the color for quite a while and this is going to be a pretty pretty big transition from one color to another so it might take might take a few coats, and that's fine. And so that's it's such a large surface, and it's a drawn out area where the shading is going to have to transition. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But see, you know, you can pull that out, pull that color out uh, quite far, and then underneath. here create a little bit of a shadow underneath there and that definitely creates a much smoother of a transition than trying to do the edge highlighting yeah yeah Another thing you can do too, um, should you uh, should you desire it, is um, glazing as well. That's another technique that can work to to help um, create some highlights and some shadows. Um, I'm going to put I'm going to do what I'm going to do here is <clears throat> the these two shadows that I just placed right under this lip here and right along this edge here. They had a a edge to butt up against. Um, but I'm going to kind of show you how to how to blend a shadow in kind of a middle area where you don't really have that edge to uh, to butt up against, and that's going to be just kind of right around here. And really, in the end, a lot of the color there ends up getting wiped off, but some of it ends up staying enough to create a little. Right, right. Move this water bottle all together. There we go. And then uh, on the back here, we're going to have a pretty strong highlight right under that uh, that crease or shadow right under that crease right there and what I'm going to do is actually just put that right in the middle right there and I'm going to work my blending brush along the whole edge and I can't stop to answer that alarm or else this paint will try, so just give me a second here. I thought I was hearing my own breathing. 
No, no, that's my uh, it's the alarm on my phone. I usually turn it off prior to a broadcast, but I forgot tonight. But I'm actually kind of glad this happened because um, if you look right there, you can actually see you see that little line right there. That's where the the paint started to dry before I could blend it. That's what'll happen with two brush blending if you're not fast enough. Is um, you get these little watermarks or uh, rings. Best way to clean that up: just take your base color, slightly slightly diluted. And just pull it right back over it and wipe it, wipe it away like it never happened. <laughs> Come up here. I mean, this is almost creating the same effect as using a wash would do in some of these places like that where the, there's more creases. Yeah, yeah, it's very, very similar to that, um, except with the, um, the difference, one big difference being the, uh, the washes are not as concentrated of pigment as, uh, as the paints are. So, you so can, when they dry, they're not going to have as much of an effect. Right, right. The uh, the paints are going to have a lot more of a of a of a stronger effect on on the quality um, uh, or the intensity rather of the the shadow or the highlight that you're doing. Okay. What makes um, these corks nice too is you can manipulate the model from different angles, which makes it a lot easier when it comes to um, getting in there to apply uh, the highlights and the shadows. Yeah, after watching your video on Maximus, I went to Ace Hardware and picked up a few corks. They're great, man. I, I, I actually I, I can't find a hardware store out here in Idaho that carries them. So I have to buy mine off of eBay, which kind of sucks, but um, I, I have a, a constant supply coming into my home. <laughs> they didn't have any large enough for a large base, but they had ones that fit a small and a medium base. So I think I, I – oh, go ahead. I think Old Rowdy is the only thing on a large base that doesn't have to be painted. The, um, I just picked up some, some – uh, corks off of uh, eBay, some large large base corks off of eBay. I think I spent uh, maybe $3 for three of them. Wasn't too bad. Something else I grabbed at the hobby store when I first started out um, was one of those things you can, it has like the two clips and it's weighted at the bottom so you can kind of clip a model in place. Huh. I don't know how useful that will be, but kind of that way you don't have to hold the model in the hand. You can kind of get it to the side that you're working on. Oh, are you talking like a helping hand type thing? Yeah. Yeah, I've seen those. It was, was kind of useful when I was trying to get into details of the spaces because I, I have shaky hands sometimes, which I think the, the cork will help with because trying to hold on to the tiny little disc of a base painting is... Yeah, I'm a I'm a big guy. I need I need something to hold on to. I got big hands. And I, I have the same problem if I'm if I'm just uh, if I'm just holding on to that edge of the base, it uh, it's an accident waiting to happen for me. And I get a little bit of a painting ADD. I, I like to bounce around a little bit, you know, and uh, and keep working areas back and forth. And that also allows 
areas to dry because you know when you're two brush blending like this you're putting you're putting moisture back on top of the paint so if the paint's not fully dry uh, you're going to reactivate that layer of paint beneath it and um, you're going to have some problems with uh, with paint ad ad adhesion now we're going to have to kind of do the same thing right here in this area and that's just apply some of the paint and just kind of blend it in because uh, there's no no edge for it to to bump up against and what you're when I pull my my brush off camera like that when you can't see it um, I've got a, a slightly dampened towel paper towel that I keep here next to me and I'm just using the paint to are using that towel to kind of pull off the excess paint off the brush instead of letting it build up that's on the blending brush right right yeah yeah because when you're doing a, a blend like like that over a big area um, that's the last thing you want is uh, is it to, to build up and, and and lose control of it you know If I was to do basing on the privateer press bases, would it be a good idea to do the basing before I prime them? Mm, not necessarily. Um, I think it depends on how complicated you want to get with your basing. Um, if you're doing some, you know, really scenic bases with, you know, bricks and broken gears and pieces of jacks and stuff like that, yeah, probably not a bad idea. But if you're just going to put gravel, you know, so put some sand on and paint it, you don't need to worry about about priming that that's that's almost a waste of time okay yeah yeah because i mean i just i want them to look decent until i get to the point where i'll have time to to get the resin bases and do all the painting right and when we're when we're at the point uh with this model to to do some basing on it i'll um i'll take you through that and we'll, and we'll do some basing on her the other thing you'll notice too especially on this inside cloak as I am um, working this, this, this shadow further, I'm pulling the paint out further to um, each time to, to make that shadow pull further and further away and, and just building up that, um, that transition uh, a little more each time. There you go. You can see it nice from that angle right there. It takes the reflection off. You see how it's just gone from dark to slowly going out to light. Because you started with one color and then you did one layer and then after that dried a little bit, bring in another layer and bring in another to gradually create the progression instead of trying to get aggressive and do it all in one, one go. Right, and, and, and when you're working over light colors like this, I notice grays in particular are like this. Um, if you do too, if you try to get too big of a jump going, um, the, the, the transition doesn't look very smooth. It, it looks off. So... And so that, that, yeah, so you know you can see already just how how that how much that's starting to right, right, yeah, and so what I'm gonna do now is we're gonna take um, coal black and then umbral umber. mix up an e equal portion of the two colors so that's a about two two drops of the coal black two drops of the umbral umber and that's going to be my new shade color or my, my darkest shade color and this is going to have some some nice color to it you know the the mixture of the the brown and the blue um, is just going to create a nice rich dark brown color which will have which will help give some um, 
some contrast to the cloak without making it look too like it has too much contrast, you know? Yeah, it's not going to draw your eye to the contrast, but it's going to create contrast in order to... Right. And what I'm going to do as I apply this is I'm going to focus on it really heavy right here at the very, very back edge, but I want to pull it out pretty far and almost pull it over over the rest of this gray like a little bit of a glaze and even, you know, and just let that color kind of uh, permeate the whole the whole cloak, if you will. There we go. You can see the. Let me get this um, palette out of the picture. There you go. And you see the depth that it adds to that gray. Depth that it adds to the shadow, while still um, still maintaining that gray hue that you wanted. probably go back and do one more coat of it too on that in, on the inside there. Gives it more of the feel of that the cloak isn't new out of the box. This is the first time that she's worn it. Right, right. And, you know, when we were talking about the, the colors that you wanted to use for this army, um, this is actually really similar, these colors that we're using, to the uh, studio paint scheme for Crix that's found in the Forces of Crix book. And um, just real, it's real similar to that. And, and as we were talking about colors, that was kind of the first the first thing that popped into my head of uh, what I think would look really good on your Mercs. So. Yeah, I have to do with Alexi and the Risen and some Forge Guard. Oh yeah, they would Forge Guard would look uh, would just look straight up mean, like this man. Definitely have to have some redheaded stepchildren in that. Uh, <laughs> I think too, if you um, if I remember right. Their shoulders uh, have their shoulder pads have a little icon on them, don't they? I can't remember at the moment. I know they have the backpack and then basically a full suit of armor. If so you the could backpack, I would probably do in the gray, like this this shade of gray. Well, I I, I would think if you did the armor in this shade of gray, and then found some way to work a little, just a little bit of yellow in somewhere, um, you. Know, buying into the whole construction theme of the dwarfs, you know? Uh, well, and with the, um, the, like the galleon, where the, the arm's going to have that construction, almost tonka toy look to it. Yeah, yeah. With the claw. Yeah. Tying that, I, I mean, I know there'll be a different list, but still look good. Yeah, oh no, I agree. I agree. I think maybe do the yellow in, the, in their, um, in the black panels, like on the tip. Almost for like the glow effect. Oh yeah, that could be sweet. Because I know a lot of people do like the blue for the glow effect. Uh huh. Yep. I, but I think yellow would kind of give it that almost like a, an electrifying. Yeah. Look. Yeah. No, I agree. It it, it would uh, and it would add some some color to the gray to the grays of the of your mercs, you know, which is going to go a long way to make them look pretty good. Yeah, instead of doing the olive green on every single one, kind of find a different highlight color for each unit. Right, yeah, yeah. Like I know in the Risen, uh, a lot of them have like Kador hats and stuff on, so the red could kind of be the, the highlight color in those. Mm-hmm, yep. Now, um, we've, we've talked about blending over kind of large areas like this, and um, I want to get close here to wrapping up for the night. Um, on this, 
but I want to show you just some blending techniques for small areas like around the hood here okay um, because you're you still can use two brush blending you just have to be a little more um, you have to be just a little faster with it really so um, get myself set up here and, and I'm actually not going to put the Crick's Bane base into these small cracks I'm gonna go straight to this this darker oh, mix no. yeah because they're smaller areas so so the you do less of a transition exactly yeah yeah if you tried to do five layers in that small of a space it would almost come redundant And you can see how how that went, how quick that went right there. In areas where you do the two brush blending, would you typically want to go back and still do a wash over them, or is it enough of a, a shading to where you're not going to need to go back and do a wash on those areas? It all depends um, on what your what your final uh, your final scheme that you have in mind is. Um, often, when I'm done two brush blending, I'll go back and add a very thin ink wash to an area uh, just to to give it some color. You know, some um, some of the the saturation of the color might have been lost. But that that really just depends on on that uh, that final look that you're going for, you know. Um, most of the time, I would say no, though. Because it seems like you've you've brought out enough of the detail, like in the cloak, just through this process, to where a wash would seem like you're not really getting much more accomplished in creating a, a depth of field. Right, right, and and um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think there's a lot of a lot of value um, in, in pushing it much further, you know, as far as uh, shade and contrast go. Now with this green color here that we're working with, you can use the same shade color that we're using on the cloak on the green as well. Let me show you right here next to these straps. And this is the, the umbral? Yeah, the mixture of the coal black and the umbral umber. And there you go. Let me zoom in there so you can see that a little better. And you can see the shading that I put in there. And we can do the same thing. For the boots and stuff like that. Um, for the boots, we're going to do something different. Um, what I was going to talk about here was the kneecap. Um, where am I on the screen? There I am right there. So you would want to start out at like a lower point on it and kind of drag it towards the higher part where more light would be? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's what you're, you're going for there. You want, um, and that's just more of a of a global type uh, shading. Um, but the other thing that it does is it ties the colors together. So now, if we back out, using that's that a dramatic of a, a pop. 
yeah, yeah, it, it tones it down just a little bit, but it also creates more harmony between the colors so that they don't, um, they don't contrast as much, you know, and you end up having um, something that just is a little more complementary um, to one another. Yeah, we don't need a John Deere green. Right, right. And then once we add that uh, bronze color on the trim there of the armor, um, I think you'll really have some nice, a nice effect going. Um, as far as the boot goes, what, what I'd recommend we do, just to keep it simple, uh, Army Painter, ink, strong tone. I use this stuff all the time. Um, my buddy Rick calls it talent in a bottle. And um, for an area like the boot, where, where it's not going to get a lot of uh, attention, or you don't necessarily need to put a lot into it, uh, just load up a little bit of the wash on your on your brush and just hit the whole boot hit the whole boot in the, in this particular case and then what you want to do though is you see the the pool the pooling that you have on the edge here you you want to wipe that off cuz it's going to leave a little bit too much of a yeah a sheet in that crack if you don't yeah you don't have to worry about getting it on the other colors since it is just a, a wash but it if you leave too much of it it's going to Right, right, and what? Too much, more of an effect than you wanted. Right, not only more of an effect, but you also get a little bit of a ring too once it dries. And um, you know, when when we hop on next time, I'll make sure to point out what that looks like when it's dried, and you know, it's going to blend in just fine. It'll look great. Um, but yeah, that's. So bring all the details of the food out, and also kind of tone it down. Right, yeah, yeah, and you know, we could do the same thing on on this boot. Uh, up in here. All right, that cloak's actually looking pretty hot. I like it. Colors that I was going to go for. Good, good. Now, as far as the rest of the model goes, um, on her arm here, um, you know these uh, these little armor plates will probably do in the green. Uh, same with uh, you know this one here. However, on her leggings here, you know she's got some some leather legging leggings there. We'll probably do those in the same brown. Give it a wash. Um, same with the uh, the quiver. Yeah, yeah, and then um, her uh, chain mail will definitely go with um, uh, <clears throat> the pig iron on that one. I think that that will go really well. Uh, on her chest, um, she's got, we could either go with the same brown that we're going to do the leggings, or we can add a little bit of green on the chest there, your call. Um, and then uh, for her crossbow, I can show you a quick technique I do for, for wood, which actually looks really nice. Uh, when we get to that. Um, but you know as far as the cloak goes I just need to clean this front edge up here and I think we'll call the cloak done and um, we'll move on to the next parts uh, on the next broadcast we get to. Um, awesome. Yeah ne next time I think what I'm going to do uh, between uh, now and the next time that we we broadcast is I'll probably paint uh, block in some of the colors so we're not just spending time watching me paint. Doing basing. Yeah, yeah, I'll get all the basing done so that um, when we're on camera we can do the highlighting and the shading. And then next time what I would like to do is focus on, um, uh, let me get a good look here, uh, focus on painting the face for you too. Um, because that's going to be a tight spot to get into and that's going to be a good place to talk about um, techniques for getting shading, into the Shading, skin tones. And things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So. Um, so do you have any other questions tonight for now, Chris? No, I think that's pretty much it. All right. Maybe I'll try to get some pictures of uh, stuff that I work on up somewhere for you to take a look and maybe get some pointers. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. I would love to. Um, I would love to do that and, and be able to help you out with that. And and you know, just as a reminder too, 
the um, this tutorial video that we're doing for you, not only are you getting the airtime now, but when you get the model back and you're working on this on your own, you know, there's time there that uh, is included in what you paid for of you and I chatting back and forth and me helping you out more. So uh, make sure to take advantage of that when you get to that point. Good stuff. Yeah. All right, man. Well, I will uh, shoot you an email. We'll talk about when we're going to be on next. Uh, otherwise, thanks for being on with me tonight, bud. All right. Thank you. All right, Chris. Take care. You too.